Proverbs 16 and 24 says, Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Welcome to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church. We welcome you to our worship service. We pray that you get something out of our virtual experience. May God bless you. May God keep you.
when life is crazy. Keeping calm when life is crazy. Brothers and sisters, in the motion picture entitled Moving, Richard Pryor portrays a character by the name of Arlo Pear. If you are at all familiar with this movie, then you would know that Arlo Pear, like all of us, had some real challenges that he had to overcome in his life. After losing his job, he had been given a promising career, and although he received the promise of gainful employment, he had to make a transition from New Jersey to Boise, Idaho. And isn't that how it is in life? In order for us to get to one level, level to the next level, we have to make a conscious transition. And although he had to promise uh, the promise of a better life, in that transition, he experienced a multitude of hardships. He uh, experienced a multitude of harshness, a whole lot of hell, and his share of high water. I mean, if you look into the life of Arlo Pear, after losing his job, he came home to an obnoxious neighbor uh, a rebellious daughter, an upset wife, bills stacked up to the sky, his dog was half dead, and to make matters worse, in transition he had to deal with crooked movers who took advantage of his easy demeanor and not only destroyed his stuff, but they took off with the moving truck. Arlo Pear was at his wit's end and the place where many of us uh, would find ourselves after experiencing tumultuous turmoils of life. Brothers and sisters, Arlo Pear was at that place where brothers and sisters, he was about to lose his cool, he was about to explode, and he was about to blow up. And I'm sure, uh, pleasant parishioners, we've all found ourselves at that place, at that place where it seems like everything that could go wrong is going wrong. You're at the cusp of cussing. You're close to the edge like Grandmaster Flash said, trying not to lose your head. You are about to explode on the next person that seems like they were about to get close to your last nerves. But brothers and sisters, as we look at this particular pericope, as we look at this passage, we peer in on this text, we discover that David is in a similar situation. He was in a time of ambiguity, he was in a time of uncertainty, and he was in a time of anxiety. God had revealed unto him his divine potential, but his experience, on the other hand, at this point was nothing but distressing predicaments. He knew what God had promised him, but his experience was riddled with problems. He knew what God had said to him, but none of God's promises at this point in life came into fruition. And I'm sure many of us have, have, have been at this juncture in life where we ask God, how can God, how can you say one thing and the circumstances of my life say different? David was anointed king of Israel. He was anointed 
during Saul's reign over Israel, but he did not take the throne immediately. He was anointed the king of Israel at 17, but he was not appointed until he was 30. Here we experience, brothers and sisters, the tension of knowing what God has in store for us while existing in the reality of the not yet. And I want you to understand that that is a frustrating place to be where we understand and we know what God has for us, but right now we're existing in the reality of not yet. And I just want to ask a few of us virtually, has anyone ever experienced the frustration of being promised one thing, but having to live in the moments of unrealized expectations? Has anyone one ever experienced living life in reality where it just seems like your aspirations are denied, your dreams are deferred, your hopes are on hold, your promises seem to be postponed. Brothers and sisters, is there anyone in here or out there today ever understood that God is a caretaker but it just seems like you're not taking care of. You're living under the strain of realize what God says, but it is not yet finalized what he's doing. You know that God is real. You know that God is real, but so is that eviction notice that you're holding in your hand. You know what Jeremiah 17 and 1 says, bless is the one who trusts in the Lord, but your reality is that you trust him, but yet and still you find that your reality, that you're still in a mess. If so, don't be discouraged because what I've discovered is that oftentimes before you reach your dreams, you'll experience the opposite of what you desire. If you don't believe me, let's walk through the biblical text. The children of Israel, they dreamed of entering a land that was flowing with milk and honey. But first they had, had to experience a desert with no food and no water. Come on, walk with me, brothers and sisters. You all remember Jacob, don't you? Jacob dreamed of a beautiful bride named Rachel, but first he had been tricked into marrying Leah. Y'all, let's even talk about him. Let, let's talk about Abraham. Brothers and sisters, you all remember Abraham. Abraham dreamed of what God promised, the promised child, but first he had to experience a problem child. Brothers and sisters, let's walk even to Joseph. Joseph dreamed of God's promise of being promoted through God's providence, but first he experienced being thrown in a pit and having an extended stay in prison. One thing I share with you, brothers and sisters, you can know what God is doing for you, but you first, you've got to experience valley lows. One thing that I appreciate about being in a valley is, is that they give you the momentum that you need to get to the top. I was riding my bike today, brothers and sisters, and I noticed that uh, uh, there are many hills and there are, are many uh, slopes and, and in my riding and in while I was riding my bike, I understood that when I started to go to a low place, I started to pick up a little bit of speed. And what I'm sharing with you is, brothers and sisters, I picked up a bit of speed, not because I just wanted to go fast, but what I understood that that speed helped me give me momentum so that I could climb the hills that were ahead of me. All 
I'm saying to you today that sometimes, brothers and sisters, you are headed into the valley so that God can give you momentum so that you can climb your hill. I'm pressing forth. So here we discover David who is on edge because the reality of God's promise has not yet been fulfilled. He's ducking Saul, he's hiding in caves, he's leading 600 men who were in debt and under distress and feeling discontented. And brothers and sisters, to add insult to injury, if you follow the narrative of the text, he runs into a fool named Nabal. Trust me and trust you me. The worst time for you to run into a fool is that when you're already on edge. The worst time for you to run into a fool and if you're low on fuel. But brothers and sisters, wait a minute before you pop off uh, at that mean boss or that insensitive supervisor. Hold tight because there are a few things that the text attempts to teach us to help us to keep calm when life gets crazy. First of all, as we look at this particular pericope, as we look at this text, one of the things that sticks out to me is, brothers and sisters, that there is always a threat to your prudence. There's always a threat to your prudence. Let, let, let me say it like this. There will always be those people and there will always be those predicaments that threaten your prudence. Somebody may be saying, well, Reverend Letcher, what do you mean threaten my prudence? What I'm saying to you is that there will always be situations or simpletons that will cause you to lose your cool. And when you lose your cool, you tend to make bad decisions. Look at the text. Walk with me. David and his men had been providing security for Nabal. They had been providing security for this rich man for free of charge. Because of David and his men, no one ever stole from Nabal. Because of David and his men, his cattle and his assets were guarded against the dangers of wild animals and enemy nations. Because of David, brothers and sisters, Nabal was straight. Nabal's employees were protected by David's men. Nabal was successful because of David. There are some people in the world that just don't realize how blessed they are because of the help of other folks. But when you look at it, brothers and sisters, all David wanted Nabal to do was just share some reciprocal care. All he wanted Nabal to do after his men protected his estate, all David wanted Nabal to do was just give them a little food to eat and a little bit of water to drink. But Nabal, as foolish as he was, instead of assisting David, he insulted him. It's a shame that when you run into people who have the power to help you, but instead of helping you, they tend to hurt you. Brothers and sisters, before you blow a head gasket, it is important for us to understand on this short sojourn with the Savior, brothers and sisters, it's important for us to understand that there are particular people, there are particular places, there are particular things that are assigned in this life to aggravate you. 
There are particular things, there are particular places, uh, there are particular people who are assigned to aggravate you. There are people who are sent to set you off. You know that neighbor that won't mind their own business, don't you? You know that person who complains about everything you do, although you have a whole lot to do. You all know that member who instead, brothers and sisters, of nurturing healthy relationships, they sow seeds of discord all around the church. You all know that there are some folks that are assigned to get under your skin. There are some folks that are assigned on this side of the Jordan River to ruffle your feathers, but don't allow them to do it. Don't allow them to do it. Nabal, brothers and sisters, was that fool. And somebody may be saying, well, Reverend Letcher, why? Your name calling. Well, I'm not name calling because Nabal was a fool by nature and he was a fool by name. If y'all look at it, if you're looking at the text, you'll understand what the text is trying to tell the people. Nabal's name meant fool. And if you follow the narrative, brothers and sisters, I didn't want to tell you this. But you need to know this, you are always on this side of the Jordan River. You are always run into some Nabals. You, you are always run into some fools in this life who are designated to divert you, but don't allow them to get you off course. One of the blessed things that I see in this text a good friend uh, once told me, they said, uh, they said, don't, uh, don't argue with the fool because from a distance, people can't tell who is who. I, I want to say that again. I think that's good advice. Brothers and sisters, when you discover that you are engaging a fool, don't argue with a fool. Don't argue with a fool because uh, a good friend told me uh, that when you argue argue with a fool, you uh, people can't tell who is who from a distance. And what I deduce from the text, everybody knew Nabal was a fool. I mean, they even called him a son of Baal. And that, that's funny because that's a colloquialism which means worthless. Only the King James Virgin says son of Baal. What I'm saying is that brothers and sisters, if you look at the text, son, uh, the, I, I ain't going to even say that, but the, the son of Baal, brothers and sisters, what they were saying is that he was so worthless and he didn't have any value. And what I'm trying to share with you, brothers and sisters, is don't spend your time and don't spend your energy arguing with people who are not of value. Samuel 25, 17, they knew he was a fool. He said he's such a worthless nobody. Uh, nobody can talk to him. Uh, the Holman Christian Standard Bible uh, says he's worthless, but the King James Virgin says he's son of Baal. And I want to pause parenthetically and say that it is unfortunate when someone becomes such a fool, nobody can reason with you. Somebody may be saying, well, in a perfect world, pleasant parishioners and the partners of PG, uh, we never become turned by nimcompoops. In a perfect world, the pleasant parishioners uh, and partners of PG, in a perfect world, we never get sidetracked by fools. But the fact of the matter is, there is somebody who can remember that time when they lost their cool because either of a fool or of a situation. But that's okay because as David as his drama unfolds, 
you will see that you're not the only one who acted out of anger. The text tells us that David and his homeboys strapped up to come see about Nabal. In other words, they headed out, if you read the text, David told his men, 400 men, he said, put on your swords because we are about to go and kill Nabal and his family. But thanks be unto God that God sent someone to intervene before David followed through on a bad decision. And brothers and sisters, I, I just thank God that God tends to intervene when we get to a place where we experience the final straw. We, when we get to the place where we experience the final stroke, we get to a place where we encounter the straw that breaks the camel's back, we thank God that God steps in before we make a bad decision. One of the things that I tell you, brothers and sisters, first of all, there's always a threat to prudence. There's always a threat to prudence, but also understand that thoughtfulness and discernment usually de-escalates problems. Let me say that again. Thoughtfulness and discernment usually de-escalates problems. It's a good thing that before things got too ugly, the Lord intervened. And that's just what God does for us before things get too ugly in our lives. God has a way of stepping in. God has a way of intervening. God has a way of stepping in before we make a dire mistake. In our narrative, he used a woman named Abigail. Abigail was Nabal's wife. She was the most rational thinker of the three. You see, Nabal's pride was in the way. Nabal's pride was concerned with who was right, but Abigail's humility was concerned with what was right. I mean, yes, it, it was Nabal's choice not to give David anything, but Abigail was thoughtful enough to know that David was due something. So she was not concerned about who was right, but she was concerned about what was right. She was not concerned, brothers and sisters, about him uh, he was concerned, she was concerned about Nabal making the right choice. And it's always good, brothers and sisters, to have thoughtful and discerning people around you. I like Abigail because she knew how to diffuse a tense situation. If you all walk with me uh, through the text, I promise you I'll let you go and you won't have to fast forward me too many times. Verse 24 uh, of uh, chapter, uh, uh, verse 24 of chapter 25 says, she fell, uh, she fell at his feet and said, I accept the blame in this matter, my Lord. Please listen to what I have to say. She used the word Lord. But she didn't use it in a way that it was the uppercase. She used it in the lower case. In other words, the lower case Lord, as she was addressing David, was a title used to designate royalty. Somebody is missing what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is, brothers and sisters, sometimes we need folks around us who can see the royalty in us. I want to back up just a moment. Say sometimes you have to be big enough to resign your ego to become humble enough so that God can bless you with more than enough. 
when you abase yourself before God, God will lift you up. And I want somebody to understand that when you lower yourself, when you make yourself humble, God will lift you up. And when God lifts you up, brothers and sisters, he will allow you to soar over silliness. When God lifts you up, brothers and sisters, you can glide up over the things that will make you mad. When he lifts you up, you can fly over foolishness. When God lifts you up, you can go high when they go low like Michelle Obama said we still go high when they go low. She didn't come uh, to this understanding and this thoughtfulness on her own. But one of the things that I share with you brothers and sisters, she came to this because God gave her discernment. And her discernment helped her to recognize the king in David. Even though he had not yet begun to walk in his role as king, she was discerning enough to trust in what God said to King David. David didn't have a crown on his head at this point, he was dirty. He was living in a cave with 600 rejects. He was frustrated, broken, angry. He didn't have any possessions, but through the discernment that God gave her, in her discernment, she still believed that David was somebody that God loved. She still believed in David. She believed that David was the king. Sometimes we need people in our lives that help us to remember who we are. We need people in our lives to help us not only to remember who we are, but we need people in our lives to help us to remember God's word. We need people around us, hanging out with us, that even though we don't look like a king or a queen, brothers and sisters, we need somebody that still not only believes in us, but believes in God's word. In other words, we need someone around us that when we are afraid, uh, brothers and sisters, we can hear the word of God quoted through their mouths when they said, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. We need friends that when we are down, we need a friend to tell us that God can, uh, uh, God is able to lift you up out of a dark spot. We need uh, friends, brothers and sisters, that tell us that uh, he will bring you up out of a mire pit, a mire clay, and place your feet on a uh, solid rock and establish your glowings. When you have ventured far from God, you need someone who will be able to give you a word from God, just like in James 4 and 8, when James 4 and 8 says, draw close to God and God will draw close to you. When you are alone, you need someone to remind you what God said in Hebrew 13 and 5. It says, I will never leave you or forsake you. When you are in the midst of chaos, we need a friend sometime that just let you know uh, that the Lord uh, will never leave you. And we need a friend to let you know that even while you're in the midst of chaos, God will keep you in perfect peace. Those whose mind is stayed on thee. She helped him to recognize that he was God's anointed. She helped him recognize 
that he was still a king even though he didn't look like it. Brothers and sisters, we need people in our lives to help us keep calm when things are crazy. The last piece, as we look at this text, uh, brothers and sisters, as we look at this text, we see, first of all, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, that in this life, there will always be a threat to our prudence. In other words, there will always be some obstacles where people uh, want to get you off track. And then, brothers and sisters, there will always, uh, uh, then we have to also understand that thoughtfulness and discernment de-escalates problems. And the last piece is uh, uh, the 32nd verse. We ought to give thanks for God's provision. We ought to show thankfulness for God's provision. I don't know about you, but I just thank God for the Abigail's that I've crossed in my life. When I was about to make a foolish decision, I just thank God for somebody talking to me and talking me out of a bad decision. I thank God for their thoughtful actions. Brothers and sisters, God will give you what you need. God will give you what you need. To stay calm when the world gets crazy. The door of our Father's house is open. The door of our Father's house is open. The door is open. The door is open. Brothers and sisters, although we are not in the church building, I want you to understand that you don't uh, have to be in the building to be the church. You don't have to be in the building to be the church. But I share this with you, we're living in a time where you need to be a part of a church. So the door is open. Pleasant Green is ready and willing to be a church home for someone who does not know Christ. The door of the church is open. If you'd like to join Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church, Brothers and sisters, you can reach out to a pleasant parishioner that you know personally, or you can send an email to ghpruitt uh, at gmail.com. And when you send that email, brothers and sisters, we will respond within 48 hours. May God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Also, brothers and sisters, we uh, thank God for all of our guests. If you are a guest online, we bless God for you. We are a church uh, who is striving to become pleasantly purposeful for all people through five tenets. Five tenets, brothers and sisters, we're striving to become per pleasantly purposeful for all people through five tenets. Also, we want to encourage all of you who have been practicing generous giving. Thank you. We thank you. We thank you for your practice in generous giving. You all know what scripture alludes to say that we can't be God giving. Uh, God gives and he pours into us good measures, pressed down, shaken together, shall men give unto your bosom. We want to encourage you to keep giving. And brothers and sisters, if you have not been practicing generosity, I want to share with you the modes in which you can do so. You can send a check or a money order to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church at REB, Rev. G.H. Pruitt Place, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, 63113. You can send that. Brothers and sisters, again, a check or a money order to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church at REB Rev. G.H. Pruitt Place, St. Louis, Missouri, 63113. Also, brothers and sisters, you can give online at www.pgmbcstl.org, www.pgmbcstl.org. 
Brothers and sisters, we've had an awesome time. I don't know uh, if you've had uh, as good of time as I've had preaching to you. Uh, I love you. And brothers and sisters, we want you to stay in tune with what we are doing in the future at Pleasant Green. Uh, we want you to uh, keep your eyes on God and your heart uh, right with him. With that being said, brothers and sisters, we've had a great time. Let us pause for a moment of prayer. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord shine upon you. And may the Lord give you peace. May God bless you and may God keep you until we meet again. Pleasant parishioners and partners of PG, we pray that your experience has been evoking. We pray that it has been encouraging and we pray that it has been inspiring. Until we meet again, may God bless you and may God keep you.